you, you, you tell us what you need from us, man. Uh, you know, we created an amazing show with amazing people, and we're hoping that the uh, the general public loves it just as much as we love it. So that's our goal. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so. As far as things that I've got to ask you guys, um, we'll we'll get to that later. But uh, Sean Paul Ellis, which you guys, uh, I believe Dan has spoken with them in the past on the Saturday Morning Cartoons. Um, he's echoing a statement that I, uh, a question that I think we all can really get to, which is we understand that Netflix and Nick, uh, aren't throwing a lot of PR and press around for the shows. How can we help glitch text, uh, get noticed beyond trending on Twitter, etc.? We should probably try to clarify a little bit that like first to say, yeah, you know, I mean, I think, I don't think there's anything personal going on or any agendas regarding our show. I think that the politics of the industry right now is in a lot of upheaval. And I think to the Nickelodeon, they are, you know, they have, you know, separate priorities and they see as Netflix being able to, as our distributor, being responsible for some, that to some degree. And I think Netflix feels that they have such a global presence uh, in 150 countries with an average of like, you know, three accounts per household, um, that, that is, that in and of itself is a tremendous amount of exposure and that their algorithm does all it can to target us to, um, you know, the most likely demographics, but also it it tries to reach, you know, others, uh, that may be open to us as well. So, you know, they they feel they're doing all they can, they can, and nobody's really there to do any traditional outreach like we're all used to so you know we do wish that were a factor and we have said in the past that it really is up to the fans to help um including us with the shows that we're fans of that we want to bring visibility to that we just you know follow the show hashtags recommend to friends recommend to um websites um that might be interested in carrying information about the show or reviewing us and always making sure you just let nick and netflix know directly by you know um tweeting at them or sending them mail or visiting their website to just say that you love the show right now that's pretty much it you know it really comes down to the fans ultimately i mean uh you know viewership is everything and as you can see you know you put on avatar and you have generations that grew up watching avatar uh you know now showing their kids and it just you know it's that kind of power is amazing because you're able to sit down and watch a great show um you know as a parent and now introduce it to you to your kids as well and that's pretty powerful so we feel that you know um we've created a show that uh can touch uh the parents uh and also like inspire the kids to be like wow this is great and everybody can just kind of sit down and watch and enjoy a show like ours so uh, you know for us that's the goal and the best way to kind of like get that kind of promotion out there is, at the end of the day is really just telling people uh you know, letting people know out there that, you know, there's a show that exists, you know, that can uh, be watched by everyone because that was our goal. You know, we, you know, we don't aim our stuff just for kids. It was something that, you know, we wanted to create that uh, everybody can sit down and watch as a family and really enjoy. There is so much content out there and a lot of studios, you know, especially at a time where you know, economically, there's a lot of risk right now and everybody's, you know, feeling the, the crunch of, of, you know, our country's economy. Um, it takes a lot when they put themselves out there by going and merchandising something, they usually have to make those deals very early. And if the audience isn't there and people don't buy, which has been happening more and more for many reasons to a lot of even really solid properties, you know, those companies, they, they lose hard. So it's kind of a test right now, too, to just see, like, will fans kind of order what they want to buy? You know, we're living in a very a la carte society and we have um, uh, a great deal of reach in social media. So, it's you know, most of these companies know that, like, well, they're not just going to go make a deal with Funko. They're going to wait for Funko to probably come to them. You know, and, and same thing with video game companies and stuff. And why will those companies come to them? Well, either they're fans of the show and think there's opportunity or people have been dogging them online saying, please make Glitch Text merchandise so that they then have to go to whoever owns Glitch Text and ask, hey, 
you know, apparently there's people who want us to work with you. Right. So that, that's the new world, I think. So if you love Owl House and you want Owl House books, tell the comic book companies, tell the publishing companies, you know, same with Glitch, she whatever you're into, Kipo, you know, just go directly to the source and ask. It seems ridiculous and that you think, you know, you're only one person and your email just goes out into the void. But if enough people do it, yeah, if you reach out, if you reach out, you'll you might get a response, and it's better than not saying anything at all. Um, yeah, you bring up a, a point, Dan, about how um, it seems like the world of marketing has kind of figured out, you know, coming to influencers or going to big influencers for things. You see clothing brands, uh, uh, video game studios, you know. Uh, you know, phone makers, anybody who develops technology, going to all these large YouTube channels and going to these large creators and saying, hey, we'll give you some money, use your platform, use your voice to to spread our product. Um, do you think that the animation industry is going to maybe take a step in that direction at some point? Because it seems like animation and maybe film in general hasn't quite taken that cue from from other from other parts of the industry. Eric, what do you think? I mean, I, I know it's just happening so fast and these companies are kind of slow to make the adjustments. No, oh, it, it's it's funny. You would think that, you know, uh, these decisions are made uh, really fast and they're on top of it. But I mean, Nickelodeon was a perfect example of kind of waiting to see what happens, right? Uh, yeah. When everybody was, was flipping over to streaming and figuring out the whole streaming concept, I mean, Nickelodeon really stuck to their guns on cable um, until, right, there was a merger and CBS All Access happened and what have you. But that just happened like, what, a year and a half ago or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when everybody else was preparing for the game, um, some of these companies kind of wait and see. So. I feel that when it comes to, uh, you know, that question in particular, unfortunately, it is a wait and see uh, for some of these companies because the industry is changing so much. Um, but to us, because we're constantly in communication in social media and we're looking at what's happening, I mean, it's very obvious to us, right? We're just saying like, of course, it's crazy. Why wouldn't you uh, switch over? Why wouldn't you um, really put the weight on what people are saying, you know, and and use that. But there are a lot of companies who are actually uh, succeeding in that way and paying attention to the atmosphere and saying like, wow, the environment is changing. So they react and those are the companies who really kind of uh, have been striving in this whole social media change. Um, it would be great, you know, to really kind of have more uh, ownership in that game when it comes to uh, merchandise when it comes to seeing how things are changing and what what people want because obviously it's just been so rewarding for us and we thank the fans uh, who have been following us and really supporting the show to see this evolution of saying like wow there's a show that exists and I want to fight for it I mean that that just warms our hearts because we, we definitely work really hard not not that other shows don't everybody really does but you know this is something that was really special for us and we try to do it as responsibly as we could um and, and it's just been beautiful to kind of see everybody out there that are saying like hey we want toys we want merchandise we want these things and and, and for us we're like yeah we want that too of course that's something that we would want but we just don't have control over that it really always does especially right now it comes down to the uh the audience and the fans really demanding what they want and we have a lot you know, again, we have, we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, but we have another season sitting there waiting uh, for the fans. Yeah. yeah it's my, a good portion of it's almost done. Yeah. Having, having listened to a couple of interviews in the past couple of weeks and just knowing that there's another, another 10 episodes sitting there, you know, ready to be finished off in the oven, just, it, it makes me nervous, but it gets yeah. me excited for the future of the show, especially after how the last season went. Um, this is actually something that I, I've been curious about um, which you have talked about this a couple of times on social media but I haven't heard it in any of the interviews where there's a design change that Mitch has in the in the towards the end of season two I think it's episode seven oh, yeah. uh, the real glitch text where we first see it um, and I can't remember if it was Eric or Dan but one of you had mentioned that there was originally going to be an episode surrounding the change that 
give that you know influences that design change um but that the weird production cycle that uh glitch texas went on kind of got in the way of that um is there potentially in season uh in season three if we get it um kind of the remnants or a new take on that episode considering the costume change has already happened i don't think we would redo the story but the ability to tweak our boards would be possible you know so we might do it for for that and other reasons usually if there's quite a few reasons to do it and we felt we had time we might but it, it wasn't a story point so much as um just a clean transition from one set of episodes to another there was more oh. consistency okay. although it, it is a it's a um a plot point but a minor one it's just kind of like a new way to to see that the characters level up and they change and, and stuff. And, by, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but I do believe around that time when we were ta talking about, like, again, we were already planning out that set, that, that third half, right? We um, we got the notice, you know, at that point already that things were going to change. Uh, we weren't going to get, you know, uh, we, we halted production, all that stuff. We had to make certain decisions and we moved episodes around. And... Yeah. Um, we ha also had to figure out like, I mean, you know, to your point is, I think we did have something in there talking about how, the, you know, they have upgraded, you know, their, their outfits and what have you. And we have an episode in those additional 10 uh, that are going to have Five and Miko also like level up, right? But it, it, it's an episode that strictly talks about them leveling up, right? So you know, we didn't get the chance to level them up like we wanted to uh, and finish that whole storyline because you're right, we see uh, Zara, Hanish, and Mitch all leveled up in their new outfits, but that was all decisions we had to make um, while we were in production, knowing that things were gonna end um, and then halt at that moment. So we couldn't really finish off that storyline. So there were episodes that we um, uh, purposely moved around because we just felt it was more important to move these episodes in these last batch that you guys just saw um, yeah, to right. tell more of that story. Because the truth is, we probably wouldn't have certain episodes that would satisfy you guys as the audience, right? If we didn't move some of those episodes around, but we had to put what Dan calls like these temple episodes in there to at right. least keep the stories as consistent because you also have to realize that as much as we wanted to personally uh, serialize like this show, mm -hmm. the network at the time when we were first developing it, they, they wanted more of the monster of the week. They didn't want that heavy storyline. And so we figured out a way to kind of please them and us by doing these uh, temple episodes that really tie into the bigger story. And then those other episodes that you can mix and match and move around as well, but still have a growth in the lives of the characters, of course. Yeah, I love it. I honestly wouldn't change it because part of the show is a love letter to like Saturday morning tunes and and kind of case file shows and we did love those you know and it's it's nice to have a, a story that has a beginning middle and end you know the the difference is that it was always frustrating when you would have the shows that would hit a big reset button and right. so that, because it would mean that characters don't grow and nothing else is happening so we thought because as we started making the shows we actually realized yeah this is fun we like we like these 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 individual stories and adventures as well, because it's letting us build our world and try different concepts. Um, so ultimately it was meant to be the best of both where, you know, yeah, they, there are case file stories, but we also have uh, ongoing plot and the characters do grow from episode to episode. And even the rearranging we did, um, we did it a little bit before we even realized that our production was, was going to be frozen because, um, sometimes just for production reasons you do things out of order or you decide you want to lengthen your story but then when we did find out there was a pause we fell in love with a couple episodes for example um settling the score with its amazing dance and kaiju sequences yeah, that's, that's, that's and great story favorites. about Muto. that was originally i think meant to be episode like 25 oh. and we thought all right we we really need to see that animated. And we asked Nickelodeon and they were nice enough to say, yeah, we could do a little mixing and matching. And our producer, Lisa Woods, helped facilitate that. So we had to move a 
episode originally intended to come earlier into the batch of unfinished shows, which was a hard decision to make, but the, you know, the, the continuity other than the costume change is, is pretty clear. Right. Um, because the real good text was also one that was in that group. Right. I like the, I, I like that this, this tentpole episode and then individual set of stories have, a, have kind of allowed you to be that kind of flexible with the organization of the series and it's probably lent very much to that um it's what live action does i mean yeah buffy the vampire slayer and doctor who and like most genre live action series are that way you know you just get these like individual stories with something bigger looming and then eventually it catches up with the characters and they deal with it and then you go from there so we really tried to just model you know in a lot of ways off that kind of format right uh, let's see. Sean says, will we get more about Hector uh, Five's dad? Which that is yeah, something that's, that's part of our that's part of our bigger story, right? Like um, time, uh, you know, we, we have so many of these loose ends and we kind of did it on purpose because we wanted to eventually tell the bigger story to the series. And, and uh, again, we didn't go Dan and I didn't go into the same like, hey, let's make a great season one and see what happens. Uh, we we wanted to do a full. I, I think originally we talked about three full seasons, which uh, for Nickelodeon would have been uh, sixty episodes, yeah, right? Like yeah. you know, yeah, you know, twenty episode orders for Nickelodeon was a season. Um, so that's why originally that's why it gets so confusing because we originally said season one, and season one for us at Nickelodeon meant twenty episodes. Yeah, yeah. twenty. Yeah. Right. And then, um, and then we got picked up for half of a season two originally at Nickelodeon. So the, we were working on that, you know, what we called our season two technically, right? right. Uh, the ten, the, the half ten. But when when uh, we went over to Netflix, then they took our original original season one, which were twenty episodes, and cut those in half and right. said, "Let's call these season one, season two. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we, we, you know, as far as your original question, like we did have more of these um, uh, episodes that eventually everybody would tie into the bigger picture of the series. Okay. Yeah, in one way or another, we we expand on the characters and you learn more about them. And, you know, some are connected to main plot more than others, but, you know, we try to, we try to have little connections here and there, you know, like dad, uh, um, we're big on not playing off the the tropes so like one thing i can tell you is like dad didn't build the death star um <laughs> but you know he worked at hanobi and right. that means things and it will it will have connections but we talked a lot about the fact that you know the whole idea of like the destiny and that everyone is an integral connection to everything doesn't translate very well to, to real life and even though this is a cartoon we like that the tone is a little bit grounded so somewhere in the middle um, you know, you're going to learn more about all the characters' families and what the effect their families have had on them to make them who they are as a person, to make them the characters that make decisions they do that will affect the, the, the overall story. So we've got more of really everything that people do want to see. Um, but, you know, I don't even know that we've posed the central questions yet, um, but we've certainly touched on all the themes that we want to touch on and we'll continue to follow those. We're, we're pretty much driven by theme more than plot and we do know where it's all headed and how we want it to, to resolve. Right. You, you, you mentioned the central, the central themes and the plot, uh, just as Sean says, uh, you know, we've got a bunch of loose ends already. We already mentioned, uh, Hector's dad, but we've got, you know, Miko for some reason, she can't be white. Uh, we have Phil's cliffhanger at the end of season two, and then um, Hanobi, Hanobi maybe just doing some additional quality control on their products. Um, yeah. Just to just to throw in my hat in the ring on the Miko thing, part of me feels like um, it's it's people reading a little bit too into it. I think it'd be fun if it kind of subverted the expectation of. You know, she doesn't get white because she's special. She just got white because she just doesn't get white because as she was being wiped, it got interrupted that first time, and that now prevents any future wipings. Um, there's so like, many solid theories already, yeah. and there's a lot of reasons. 
you know, and there can, that's the funny thing is like also in stories, we assume it has to be one thing and it could be a combination of things and it could right. be, you know, so we do, we do know why and we, we hope people are satisfied because we think that it's, you know, we, we think we have solid reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know. That's all I want to say about it. I don't know that we meant for it to be <laughs> yeah. the central question it's become. That's you know having the series interrupted where it is makes everything seem so right. huge. But it is a big deal. It's certainly a big deal that she didn't reset to the to the characters and to the company. I think so. Right. You know, we'll we'll get to it. Also, you know, just more to that fact. I mean, we definitely have. It's it's a real hard thing to do because now knowing that we're kind of halted where we're at you know you want more answers right but no if you knew that we had another two seasons ahead of us then you wouldn't feel that pressure of i, I need to know all these things right yeah. and sometimes like in season one uh one of the comments that i i, uh, I did hear a lot were like wow we spent so much great time with miko and her family i want to know more about five right and yeah. then when we spent some time with Five, you know, uh, now people are like, hey, I didn't get enough Miko's uh, family anymore. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but we, we did give you more of Mitch, right? More of his backstory. And, um, you know, so we try to satisfy as best as we can, along with giving you kind of backstory of growth of their families, who they are, which we love. You know, we have a great episode that really digs into Miko's family and her mom and her grandmother. And it was just such a great episode, but that's one of the ones we had to move and um, put it to the back 10. But we have these episodes that, you know, really dig into, you know, their backstories and their family lives as well, which, you know, I love that people want to know more about the characters and their families. But at the same time, we also have to serve the bigger picture of, right. you know, Glitch Tech, Hanobi. Uh, so we're basically serving different masters at the same time and trying to squeeze it in within the space. Right. That and we, we have, have episodes with more Hanish and more Zara and more of uh, team episodes where it's like a big ensemble, which are difficult to produce, but so fun yeah. to make. And um, so yeah, we, we do more of all of it. And, and what we hope most is that people just really enjoy being in the world, being part of in the world, learning more about it by hanging out. That, that's something we always loved about Star Wars. Like you're just, when we were kids and we saw the first Star Wars, you are thrown on a ship. Yeah. You don't know what a droid is. You don't know what Leia's the princess of. You don't know what a Death Star plan is. Like <laughs> you just are overhearing and you're just picking things up as the characters talk and use their language. And we love that. We just love to, you know, try to immerse people in the tech world and have them get to know their coworkers and their friends and, you know, and kind of grow it from there. So the show is very much through Five and Miko's eyes and I think it'll stay that way for a while, but we do expand to show, you know, uh, the other characters because we fall in love with them as much as, you know, the audience seems to have. So, you yes. know, if there's a lot to observe. Right. I, I think it's interesting seeing all the influences that um, that you can see kind of bleeding into the show, whether or not they were kind of purposeful or not. Uh, you all have talked a couple of times how um, Wok Fu was a big inspiration for the style of the animation, where it's these simpler kind of head and uh, wide shots for you know your conversations and your character interactions which you know saves you a lot of money when it's time to get to the big epic animated fight scenes and set pieces um but the show also gives me a, a lot of uh slice of life slice of life vibes which is a pretty popular theme in, in anime and you see that a lot where they're just hanging around hanobi hq talking about playing a card game or a board game based yeah. on a cartoon, based on a video game, based on a cartoon, based on a... Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and actually, games I love. Talking, about, talking about the clip show, um, because clip shows are always, like, extremely hit or miss when it comes to, when it comes to shows. Um, <laughs> what point of the clip show do you think was what struck gold with you? Like, which one of the, one, which one of the little bits you did at the clip show were like... Yeah, that's the thing we need to run with for the rest of this. I, I, Eric, I you should talk about. Real, I got to say something real quick to set Dan up for this because 
Um, you know, so we had to make a decision, you know, at some point. Obviously, nobody goes in saying like, man, I can't wait to make my clip show, <laughs> you know, when you're making a series, especially uh, so early in the game for us, right? Uh, so we obviously did it uh, for budgetary reasons. We we're like, man, it, uh, we have to find a way uh, if we want to keep this the kind of animation that we were doing. Um, we had Quality. To, yeah, we had to balance. We were going from two studios to one. That that was why. Right. Right. We went from two studios to one, and they had a heavy burden. So we had to figure out a way to lighten that load, right? Uh, and to do that, we had to come up with our clip show episode. Um, but we definitely didn't go in with the intention of knowing how to make the best clip show we could. <laughs> it was very <laughs> experimental. Um, but you know, the, the thing that I love about Dan is like, you know, we, you know, we all sat around when I say we, uh, I want to uh, bring in, uh, uh, Ian Graham, our supervising producer. He was so integral to our stories as well. And when we would sit around and have our, our morning discussions, you know, we knew, uh, we had to make a show like this, but one of the things Dan said is like, you know, here are all the tropes, here are all the ways that we've all seen, uh, clip shows and we have to find a way to do this differently, you know, tell a story. If we can tell a story at the same time uh, as we're doing a clip show, that would break the mold as far as doing clip shows. And, um, you know, we all sat around saying like, geez, like that's hard because if we only have X amount of minutes for animation and the rest has to be clip shows, how do we tie a story around this thing? Um, but the whole thing was super experimental and Dan wanted to really play with this idea. So I know Ian and I were just like running around, like putting the production together because we were so busy at that time. So Dan kind of like went off and said, let me experiment with this and, and play with this. But I can tell you this, and, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we knew what we were doing. Like we were saying like, let's just throw things out there. And then you kind of like, took it away and started like playing with it. I think that's when you reached out to AJ and talked to him a bit, right? It was a theory based on two things. And one was, well, first of all, is wanting to just, you know, you want to use every opportunity you can, whether it's a line of dialogue, you want it to be a really good line that's really serves your character and your story. If you get one episode, you want to make the most of it, use it in some way. You want it to be hopefully unique to your show and you want your audience to learn something and connect and you know so you even when it seems like you know something that's difficult you want to kind of meet that challenge and for me it was also knowing that our lead designer Scott Kakuda was so depressed that we were going to do a clip show he saw it as such a loss um oh, <laughs> oh we no Dan? we lost Dan hold on coming back in all right all right, welcome back, Dan. Hey, Aries. such a lot. <laughs> um, I was like, you're going to sit in the animatic for this clip show and you're going to love it. It won't be your favorite. But it's going to be one of your favorites. <laughs> and, like, and then I thought, That's oh, how are we going to do that? Scott Kakuda was so sad that we were going to do uh, uh, a clip show. And so for Scott, and again, we're make it. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm a big nerdy Star Trek fan, and um, the original Star Trek TV series had a production issue where they had to um, basically burn off an episode, and they had an unaired pilot, and they took footage from their unaired pilot, and they used a concept where the characters on the show were watching footage uh, taken by their spaceship computer, whatever, mm -hmm. um, and it was essentially a trial to see you know, oh, Mr. Spock did something that we think may make him guilty of mutiny and we're all gonna watch this footage. And, and I just thought, oh, that was so clever. How could we tell a story using our footage and that set the kind of vibe for a trial structure, you know? Right. Ashley Birch and, and, and Donnie Miacheli, who were writers on the show, were talking about, what if it was like a game of werewolf or something, you know, where, we were trying to figure out like, oh, who's the who's the bad guy? Uh, so that set off a light. So now you had a framework and we thought, oh, great, we can kind of address the Miko question. You know, what would the characters think if they could look back over the events of the show? And then that conceit led to, oh, well, on Star Trek, when they did this, everyone was very serious, like show the evidence and let's let's watch that clip. You know? <laughs> 
the glitch techs are kids, man. Yeah, they're, they're a bunch of teenagers. Like, yeah, when you put that power in their hands, they're not gonna care. They're gonna yes. be like, oh my god, I can I have a clip show of my life. <laughs> I want to, like, I, you know, I want to do a mashup. Like, it's what any of us does when we discover iMovie for the first time now, or, you know, when you get your hands on clips of your favorite shows and you start making mashups. So we thought, oh, great. The ideas just kind of were gelling. The theory was just how to use the clips. What do we do? Um, AJ Lacascio, who uh, I've worked with as, a, as an actor and a writer, is an amazing guy, and he had done um, some YouTube poop videos in the past yeah. for like um, online sites, and he yeah. gave us tons of advice and examples of how to use the clips. We told Brad Breek, our composer, that we were interested in like maybe doing a, an insane like um, remix based on just audio clips, and you know he was totally down for that. Um, and some of Brad it was, was great. Oh, go ahead. Brad was just great. No, Brad was great. I mean, you know, I had to work with Brad Breek before on, on Fanboy and Chum Chum, and he had done something very similar uh, like this, where he just mixed it all up, made something that came back to us, and we bored it off of that. So I think that's where we were talking to Brad. We were like, hey, remember that thing you did for me? It was insane. Can you do some kind of awesome mix up with just saying the word glitch? Right? And then he just came <laughs> yeah. back with, with this amazing uh, piece, and I think we edited according to his uh, track that he laid for us. So with these concepts, we also just had to fill time. Our, our editor, and uh, Rachel Rusikoff, and our director, Hyunju um, uh, Park, they, they were saying, um, or song, Hyunju song, um, that, oh, we got a little more time to fill. And, you know, Eric Ian and I would just go in that edit room you know, try to fill the time with a cool concept. Um, we were all working together to pull clips. Um, and then for our production team and our our uh, picture editor, Ralph um, Yusbio, it was such a Herculean task for them to go actually find the clips in animation, pull those clips. And we were using overlays so that the chibis could be talking so that right. even though we couldn't fully animate our characters, you still saw them. Um, Anyway, it was bananas and just a huge experiment. But I, I think when the YouTube poop sequence came together, um, you know, we felt it was going to work um, because yeah, our staff was just gathering around laughing at it. And, you know, we thought, I think this is going to, we can pull this off. Early days of it, though, man, I just remember going back to the office going, oh, man, oh, man, I don't know. Is this going to work? <laughs> I don't know. And then that we would have our morning. Yeah, we would have our morning meetings, uh, really hangouts that we would do before we started uh, production. And, you know, I just remember around that time, you know, Danny and I, we would just be like, here, man, we're just going to go for it, figure this out as we go, you know. And then the, I think it wasn't until the crew started watching uh, what we were making and they would laugh. That's when we yeah. were like, oh, we felt the confidence uh, of, of this uh, episode, right? Yeah, once... <laughs> Once I realized that it was going to be a, a clip show episode, I kind of had that, you know, that that gnawing feeling in the back of my head, like, oh, okay, yep. so this is a this is a budget episode. I get it, and yep. um, I think in a way that kind of helped my enjoyment of the episode because immediately my uh, my expectation of the episode yeah. kind of dropped. The expectations were low, but yeah. uh, as soon as I saw, I think the first one is either all the funny sounds that. Uh, five makes and it was I started giggling at it and it got progressively funnier and funnier and I lost my mind whenever <laughs> whenever it was the Mitch all the cool things Mitch does but edited over with fart sounds and I <laughs> yeah I lost my we're proud mind. of being a pretty highbrow show and we were like oh, yeah. we've got to do it we've got it <laughs> I, I think that's do, the, and it's funny. Yeah, that's the one I was most nervous about, to be honest with you, because um, you know I remember on season one of Fanboy, we had done a, a few of those episodes that had those spark joke kind of in there, right? Yeah, and and then I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. So by season two, we just never went back to it. 
but one of the things that I got consistently was like, oh, well, that show had a lot of like fart stuff. And I'm like, no, it's probably just like two or three episodes that had it, <laughs> but the stigma of that was was there. And so when we were doing it for Glitch Text, I was like, oh God, I just hope that this doesn't come back in a bad way. But the way it you... was edited, it was just hilarious that you just could not do it without- What's the concept? Yeah. We didn't cut that show. Miko cut that. Miko made that. Yeah, exactly. And that's so, why it's great. It's I like, think that's what I think that what yep. sells it so much because you have the idea of one is teenagers, so they're gonna do something funny to each other. Uh, the victim of the yeah. joke is Mitch, someone who's so full of himself. It'll be funny to humble him a little bit, and then yeah. the context of yeah, that's just something Miko would do is is find a way to make fun of Mitch in this moment. And yeah, the context yeah, well, of that it, is it, what makes it, it even funnier. It brings it to a whole new level. Yep, context is everything. Absolutely. So, Dan, Dan, Dan was a madman. He's a madman. You know, <laughs> he, he, he just would always have a big smile on his face. And th there would be some days <laughs> of worry and then some days of just giggly, you know. And, we, you know, again, we were just experimenting, but uh, I just remember. <laughs> Uh, and Scott Kakuda loved it. Scott loved it. Yeah. yeah. So that, that made me so happy. Yeah. I, knowing, knowing that like Ashley Birch and some of the others had their fingers all over this, it, 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 it makes sense that it became such a, such a like YouTube poop or YouTube. It almost felt like a commentary on YouTube. The episode itself did because there's so much of that, yeah. that, In a way, yeah. that, you know, YouTube either doesn't do anymore or used to. And in a small way, it probably felt nostalgic for kind of a trend that has moved out for someone in, in my age range, you know, 25 to 20, who remembers in high school and eighth grade, you know, watching YouTube poops for the first time thinking, wow, this is the funniest thing on the planet. Um, and it and keeps the show on theme because it's 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 actually not like glitch game it's glitch tech and although we focus mostly on video games it is about like the culture of technology and the pop culture of technology and what it means to have that in our hands you know gaming technology and how it connects us and and you know in this case too it's like when when Eric and I were growing up, you could not pick up an iPhone and edit a freaking movie. Like my <laughs> colleague from Greg the Bunny, Sean Baker, made the first film uh, to win awards. You know, he shot it on an iPhone, um, and that blew our minds. And we were cutting film, and you know, just like about seven years earlier than he did that. So. You know, the fact that a young kid, my daughter is using full on animation programs. She's drawing in yeah. Procreate, she's eight years old. Uh, the tools that are available, it's incredible because somebody who makes that YouTube poop today is probably gonna be cutting, you know, like a, we used to call them driveway movies. Like they're probably just yeah. gonna hang out with their friends and cut some video and they may end up doing God knows what, you know, in, uh, you know, in the industry. So. It's awesome. It's the power of tech. Respect it, the tech. It really is. You, I mean, I see so many, you know, I follow a lot of artists on Twitter. So I see tweets all the time of them retweeting this artist who in their bio, like, yeah, I'm 14 years old. I've only been drawing for like a year. And you look at it and it's this yeah. beautiful, you know, Magic the Gathering card quality illustration. And it's like, how do you do yeah. that? It's just they've been exposed to the tools that lead to that kind of work at such a younger age than any of us possibly could have. You know, you you see yeah, them. And they share online and they, they get they get tips from their friends and they watch, you know, YouTube videos. And that's why we also really want to put out there, you know, we, we love our team to talk to people about what they do on the show so people can learn more about what like background artists do and effects artists and yeah. you know, um, you know, just fill their heads. That's something that I pre that's something that I say on every single one of these and on a lot of my YouTube videos is follow the people who make what you like. Because not only yeah. do you get to to see more of that content, but you get to learn from them. You get the behind the scenes. You get a, an idea of Definitely. their mindset on the creation of all of this. And in at a time where you don't get a lot of behind the scenes content anymore, at least not a big focus on it. Um, um, unless it is from like, uh, we, this, I'm the director of this movie and here's a deleted scene that I just decided to tweet out. 
Um, you don't get a whole lot of that. Um, and it's, it's, we've kind of found a way around that of finding our own behind the scenes. Um, but I, I do miss that element of it. Like, I would love to see a commentary track of a lot of episodes of, of Glitch Text from you guys. Yeah, we, we would love to. We've talked about doing that with our with our team. I think that would be great. Even uh, realizing now, it would be nice almost to just ask everybody to do that in lockdown. We either do a Zoom, but also just let them record on MP3s and then just take all that all that audio and, ha and and go at it and have somebody edit like all their various points of view yeah, into like together. yeah hmm. to uh, self <laughs> um so something else that i um that i wanted to bring up was the um the production line and everything of, of glitch text has definitely been been awkward even for for has probably been unique for a lot of ways in the industry um but was there ever this you said it yourself earlier dan that uh it's like show competing with show uh and as glitch text was in production i can imagine that rise was also in production rise of the team and t was there was there uh ever you two like as studios like going head to head with each other. I know that Flying Bark, the studio that did Rise of the Team and T worked on a couple episodes of Glitch Tex. And I yeah. just wanna know like, was that part of the competitive fuel to to try and get Glitch Tex up to that level? It definitely wasn't. Um, like I said, uh, you know, before uh, Rise was even up and running, we, we were in development way before them. Okay. So we already, uh, uh, you know, yeah, we were in development for about two and a half years, right, Dan? Yeah. Um, so even before the the idea of doing Rise was even thought of, we were already developing Glitch Tech. So we already had kind of <clears throat> what we wanted to do. And uh, like you mentioned earlier, like I was a fan of Wok Fu. So I knew that this show was going to be an action show and it was going to have, you know, these kinds of scenes in it as well. Um, so we were already on our own trajectory and doing what we were doing. Um, and uh, to also continue answering your question here, like we were fortunate enough because we were looking for a studio that would take on this production and it wasn't going to be a very easy production. We knew that we were going to have these amazing action sequences and we didn't want to just send it to um, your, your, your typical kind of like, you know, uh, overseas studio that we just had no connection to the people or the artists there right we wanted to uh build a new kind of interaction like we had done with our crew we wanted to build uh communication with the studio that we knew who the artists were we knew who was animating the show uh, and and just so if people don't understand how, what i'm talking about a lot of times when you work on these animated shows for tv um you pick a studio sometimes you're not even allowed to pick the studio sometimes the studio will pick it for you and say you're going to korea and this is the studio that you're going to be using and that's it be happy with that and you get x amount of, of yeah you get x amount of retakes um but then you have to live with, with everything else we wanted to try to build a relationship with our overseas studio so it took us a while to find a studio that wanted to build a relationship with us um, and so because that took a while, we we all of a sudden got um, a request from the network to say, hey, we want to test um, finished episodes with kids. And so that put us under the spotlight to say like, oh man, we have to pick a studio even faster now while we were still looking for a studio. And luckily we had help uh, because Flying Bark was uh, had a few months of, of a little gap open before they were going to start Rise. Mm -hmm. And um, Dean Dean Hoff, which was uh, running production at the time, he was like, hey, I have an idea. These guys are going to um, start Rise, but just not yet. So why don't we go with these guys and test them out, see how they do, and it'll be a great test to see how they're going to do with Rise as well. So that gap, the which was uh, Flying Bark Studios in... Um, in Australia, they they had this little gap there, which allowed us to put our show uh, in production. So, you know, there's the two episodes, Going Going Gauntlet, and um, uh, what is it, 103? Uh, what's the title of that one, Dan? Um, 
103 was uh, tutorial mode and then uh, going, going gauntlet. Right. So those were the two episodes that we sent to Fly and Bark. Again, not knowing the studio. So Ian and I, Ian Graham and I, we just took a trip to Australia and we met with the crew and they were already uh, starting to animate the show. And they were just like this amazing group of young talent that were just excited that that this, they loved our, our animatics. They loved the idea of the show. And so when we got there, it was almost like they were happy to see us just as much as we were happy to see them, that they were excited about the show. So that relationship was amazing right out the gate. And the quality of animation that they were already doing on this show was already like, oh my gosh, this is so great. So we were able to utilize their talent to make these two episodes that allowed us to test the show with kids. Now, the hardest part for us was leaving Flying Bark because now we, we <laughs> saw what they can do. We were like, oh my gosh, these guys can do such a great job with our show, but we have to like, it was almost like, you know, we were dating them for a minute and then we're like, okay, I guess you gotta go marry the other guy. <laughs> you know? They were betrothed <laughs> to another. Oh no. But, so, I mean, uh, there was there was healthy tension only in that, like, you know, we started using the studio. So, Ant Ward and, and Andy Siriano over at Turtles, they were like, uh, are you guys taking our studio? And I was like, no, 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 like, we're, we're no, borrowing. We're just borrowing. We'll return. <laughs> yeah, because they... We're, 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 just, we're just dating. We're just dating. You get to marry yeah. them. We're just yeah. going to date them. You know? <laughs> um, so we worked all that out. Uh, the same was true of artists. We all want the same talents. And, you know, so there were a lot of talks had to be had to say, you know, um, you know, who was on board and when we were actually really happy. You know, one of the one of the few bright spots about when our production did halt is we were at least able to call them and say, hey, if you guys need, you know, we have a couple of board artists. If you have slots open, we know that you love these guys. Right. So, you know, we tried to make it healthy because ultimately we love, and, and, and everyone on our team, we love animation, we love cartoons. We, we right. would pinch ourselves that we didn't get to work at a place like Nick. And so we were always really open with all our fellow creators and, you know, really all saw ourselves as being on the same team. So when we preach that stuff and like the real glitch text and alpha leader and all that, like that is how we roll. And, and you know, and you even see like I'll I'll tweet about renewing uh, Owl House and and Kipo and you know because I you know I love animation. We made this show because we want to see it, not because we want to control it or be the best or you know I don't think any of that is remotely healthy. Um, right. And those who are do have that mentality usually burn out or consume themselves or are just generally unhappy people anyway. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, all, all this to say, there there wasn't a lot of um, tension between our shows. Those guys showed up to our screenings. They supported us. They they tweeted about us. They you know, and and same for them. Like we, you know, we all just really appreciate one another. Right. Um, but you know, we did have to do a lot of tap dancing to make logistics work, and we did have to go to each other, kind of hands up, and say. Hey, you know, we're not <laughs> we're not trying to take something from you. And, and um, credit to Nickelodeon and the execs that we shared, like Dean Hoff and Megan Casey. They they also made that work. They they were really creative in helping us all get what we needed. Although people are frustrated at how Nick, you know, has seemingly treated those shows, there are also many examples where the studio has been very very good to us. It. It really comes down to a lot of politics and money and yeah. things that go beyond, you know, personal preference. You know, we, we actually think we made out amazingly well at Nick and neither of these shows would exist without the teams that develop them. Right. So you got to accept both sides of it. You know, we're sure frustrated and so are they for a lot of reasons. But we all have sat on each other's couch, like almost in a therapy session to say, like, <laughs> it's not personal. It's not personal. Right, right. It's all this business stuff that we can't control, you know, but it's what makes our shows possible. You know, that that money is what makes us exist in the first place. So Right. As what can you do? As as somebody who is, you know, outside looking in when it comes to the industry, what knowledge I have from it, I glean from a few friends who I know 
who, who work in studios and then what I see on social media and reading articles. Um, and even, even from that little bit of knowledge, I, I know that when it comes to situations like Rise and uh, strange production cycles for everything, even shows like Kipo, it's important to know that we don't see everything and we'll never get to hear everything because there's so much that goes into it from marketing, advertisement, production, and we can't even begin to understand the cost of all these things. So it's true. As far as, as far as it goes from us, I think it's more productive for us to just send positive vibes to the studios that we want more of this instead of trying to chastise them for not making more of it already. Um, you, you definitely nailed it. I mean, that's that's exactly the right attitude to have. Um, you know, a lot of people want to go, you know, with the the, the, the stakes and the fires yeah, the and be like, ah, oh, you know, these studios. Yeah, the pitchforks, you know, but no, it's not like that. That's not how you win this battle. I mean, you know, how you win it is basically, you know, tell them what you love, tell them what you want to see, you know, um, and, and a lot of these studios, they're, they're, they do listen. You know, it, like I said, ultimately, it always depends on what the fans and the viewers want to see. And um, that's really what matters because they, they want to be just as successful. You know, no, nobody goes to work saying, like, I truly want to fail today. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know, all these all these studios want to be successful at what they do. And, you know, whether they make the right decisions, the wrong decisions, I'm sure they just don't know. They're, they're kind of winging it. But uh, ultimately, when these things happen, right, the the. Um, the fans will say like, hey, we want more of this. And when they hear that, that's when they'll make these decisions. We are passionate fans who who got in and stayed in for a long time and have become experienced. And there's still so much we don't know, but we've retained onto that fan inside us, which is why we can really relate and say, yes, you know, you don't want to put fuel on the fire for those who would just say, oh, you can't please those fans. You know, there's a stigma that like, oh, the fans are toxic and they'll never be happy. And, and when that's only because they only hear the, the, the bitter anger yeah. um, when, when they can understand that, that the fans truly are coming, you know, less, less fanatical and more, you know, like um, appreciative um, and, and also have like smart opinions. They can they can criticize, but when they don't know the big picture it, and it comes through angry, then they're discountable. So it doesn't help. And I am I have said that, you know, I've been in a lot of Discord chats about the show, and there are questions about Nick, and people will go off with their Nickelodeon theories or Viacom, and some have no real knowledge of of it and others have a tremendous amount of actual knowledge of how things work but i say to them all like guys not only are you just like barely scratching the tip of the iceberg but you'll also never know because i don't know and <laughs> i've given up trying to find out it's not my job to know um there's no one big secret or one big plan it's many people at many companies working together under conditions that change from monday to friday because right. all it takes is one sudden merger or a company that you know has a success with something different that everyone changes everyone else um or one pandemic and like throws a wrench in <laughs> everything that they were planning on monday so you can't it, it's it's just not time well spent to sit there and figure out what uh what they're all doing Right. It, you know. it, it comes off to me like an NDA that changes on a daily basis. Um, where, <laughs> you know, you're allowed to say this right now, but in an hour, you might get in trouble for saying what I just told you you're allowed to say. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're just going to kind of not go there and hope that, you know, the powers that be make, make good decisions and have support. You know, we all need support. So there are great people at these companies. And, uh, and there are not great people, but there's no one person who is Nick or who is Disney, you know? Right. So it's hard to say Nick this, Disney that. It's just not real. Right. Um, Sue Liverman says, uh, uh, OMG, that poster behind Eric, which, yeah, it's a sick poster. Uh, if there was ever merchandise that I wanted out of, out of Glitch Text, it would probably just be a bunch of, like, big wall art posters. 
Nobody yeah. wants my 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 daughter drawing of the It's Funny crew uh, for me too. <laughs> I mean, I think that your daughter drew that for you, so you should keep it. Um, but speaking on merchandise, and just to just to end this off on a on a lighter note, I think um, we've seen people, you know, having like little call to actions for merchandise, right? We've seen uh, the Funko Pops, we've seen the the Lego toy kits. Um, we've even saw yeah. that that one uh, cosplayer who made a fully detailed blueprint and breakdown of the glitch gauntlet, which is the sickest thing on the planet. Um, that's AJ, the guy who helped us with the YouTube poop. That's that's oh. Prince Lotor from Voltron. Oh wow! Okay, that's amazing. Um, so I mean, yeah. I feel like I already know the answer, but if there is one piece of of merch that either we have seen or conceptually we haven't seen yet. What, what would it be for you two? I personally think uh, the, the Funko would be amazing. My, my you know, it, it's one of those things that you just need a Funko of, of a character in your room. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I would I would definitely love to see that. Uh, I think that'd be pretty amazing. As far as like, well, if I had to pick just one right out the gate. Like Metacom figures, like one sixth scale. Yeah. figures i love collecting those yeah and i would with all the props and stuff you know or even um so many times i'd watch something in the in the animatics that were in the animation and think like oh i want like a, a statue out of that that i probably can't even afford you know like <laughs> there's these i would always see these amazing statuettes that companies make like gentle giant and all that um, oh my goodness i mean yeah. we want all of it but i also think the most the fun is to crack open a Lego set. I think uh, Phil uh, Jacobson uh, ordered like a plush, you know, I mean, he had some, somebody was custom making these yeah. things and it's like a plush five and a plush Miko that just looks so good. I've seen that. I've and seen that. Like, Those look great. Those look so good. Yeah. I thought um, yeah. it'd be cool to have it's one of those. To do fan commissions. Uh, I would love to get one of those little, um, I don't know what the knitting is called, but the little, like the little cross-stitched uh, little <laughs> creatures, but have it be oh, Allie. Crocheted. Yeah, a little crocheted Allie. Yeah. With a little clip on it to hang off of stuff. I yeah. thought, oh, that'd be so good. That'd be adorable. Just imagine um, that same thing with, with Five's hair, because it's so big. <laughs> um, I have purchased some fan art from some fans, and I, and I have... I bought my daughter an alley shirt off Redbubble and uh, you know, like, you know, man, hey, I'm a, I'm a fan. I, I, I look for it where I can get it, you know? And and with Glitch Decks, we're not trying to sell a product. You know, we're just trying to kind of share our pride and it's kind of nice in a way that there is a DIY grassroots kind of push behind the show and it's right. not kind of a cold marketing thing. You know, we just, you know, it was made with a lot of love, and I think people really see that. And in in a way, it's kind of cool that it's it's been intimate right now. And you know, I'm sure it'll grow one way or another. Um, you know, we just we just want it to reach as many people as it can, um, so that they can enjoy it. And if we get the opportunity to make more, we're certainly ready for it. Right. We just want to finish our story. I mean, ultimately, that's what we want to do. You know, we started this journey, and and we just want. Uh, we want to tell our story. We want to finish this journey that we have with these characters, and um, it's it, it was hard. It was hard to just you know stop production and and stop their story. So yeah, we we definitely want to we you know we want to continue the adventure with these guys. Hey, and if Nick doesn't listen, tell Dark Horse, and if Dark Horse doesn't listen, tell IDW, and if they don't listen, tell your favorite game companies. And you know, I mean, if there's interest, it'll happen. I, I'm confident it'll happen. A glitch, so, sex, but we do. a glitch sex video Ooh. game would be the ultimate meta <laughs> yeah it but, would but when it but like you're saying when it comes down to it at the end of the day you guys are, are you're telling a story you know your job isn't to try and sell merch that's the people who want to make the money yeah. off of merch that's their job um yeah and we're trying to just like kind of re, you know um we're tapping into a nostalgia but it's about the feeling not the stuff yeah, it and very much is. That feeling, and then we're trying to add to that feeling. And that's what everybody got on board with. Ultimately, I think is like, you know, the it, it has, it has, it, you know, has a big heart. And that's been the thing that we also want to continue, you know. 
we love these characters as much as you guys do. As as someone who isn't typically very susceptible to no- nostalgia, probably because of my age, um, this show has managed to catch me on it a couple times, and that's been a really like <laughs> cool feeling to actually experience. Um, so. Dan, Eric, thank That's you guys awesome. for coming on. Uh, thank you for making Glitch Text. I, I hope that in even the smallest way, this can help get the word out and help season three and future seasons, you know, actually come to fruition. Um, are there anything else that you two want to say before we close this out? Watching Glitch Text, if you can, rewatch it. Because, uh, you know, every time you watch it, it definitely helps us. So you know, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Watch and rewatch. And, uh, and thank you. I, I just want to say thank you to everybody, yourself included, like so much. Thank you all for, you know, connecting with us. Thank you. Uh, we got a bunch of, uh, Dan and Eric, you guys are awesome. Thank you for bringing glitch text to the world. Thank you both. And yeah, that's, that's the, the end all, that's the end all be all of it. You know, we can only hope that we can get more of it in the future. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. See ya.